Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Twitch stream for Thursday, August 11th. We are excited to be here. We are excited to have you here. My name is Matthew. I am one of the course staff for online classes and um, an educator at Stewart Observatory. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are looking forward to your questions. Um, for those of you who are new to our question and answer sessions, the way this works is you post your questions in the chat. Uh, myself and Vicki will grab those questions and we will uh, relay them to Chris. Uh, and then we'll uh, you can you know cover any topic, as Chris likes to say, from comets to cosmology. Uh, so post those in the uh, in the chat, and we'll get those to him. Um, or you can send them via email if you prefer. Um, I will hand this over to you, Chris, to welcome everybody, and then we'll get started with questions. Okay, welcome everyone. Yes, comets to cosmology, asteroids, diarchio, astronomy. We do we do it all here. Um, Welcome if you've joined us and you're in the online class or have just found us otherwise, um, and we're ready to get started. Excellent. Um, so the first question is from Rishi Spaceman, who says, or Richie Spaceman, who um, asks, what are some of the things we can get from the James Webb Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, that will vastly improve our understanding of the universe? Um, well, it's a big purpose uh, observatory. It's one of the great observatories, of course. Uh, it is not quite the successor to Hubble because it works at a different wavelength range. And that's part of what the key to what James Webb will do that other telescopes can't do. It's, it's really tuned to work in the near and the mid infrared. These are wavelengths that are very hard to be sensitive to on the Earth because of the Earth's atmosphere. Water vapor absorbs infrared radiation. So parts of the infrared are simply unavailable to ground-based observation. And the parts that are available are sort of narrow windows of transparency. Um, so the backgrounds in space, especially in where James Webb is located, are thousands of times lower than the backgrounds on Earth for those wavelengths. So it's not simply a question of the size of the telescope, it's also the wavelengths it's working in, the pristine environment it's working in. So given that it's doing infrared astronomy for the most part, what does that enable it to do? Well, first light was its uh, original purpose and motivation to look for galaxies who are so far away, their light has been redshifted uh, to infrared wavelengths. And so they really aren't visible invisible light or ultraviolet light. So they, it can see the earliest galaxies in the universe. You can also see deep into star formation regions because dust absorbs light in general and absorbs visible light much more than it does infrared light. So it'll use its sharp vision to look at the places where stars are forming deep into star formation regions. And we saw that in one of the nebula uh, releases for the original science data a month ago. It's also gonna be able to uh, look at exoplanets, and it's going to look in the infrared. The reason the infrared is a good place to look at exoplanets is uh, exoplanets are warm and stars are hot. That means that the radiation from a star is declining into the infrared, whereas the radiation from a planet like the Earth is rising into the infrared. So if you're looking for an exoplanet near a star, the contrast or the ratio of the exoplanet's feeble reflected light to the starlight is better in the infrared by a factor of 10 or 20. So for exoplanet studies, direct imaging in particular, or spectroscopy, uh, the infrared is a better place to work. So those are just three examples, but, but James Webb will be looking at, at every aspect of astronomy. The next question is from Alexandra Panda Bear. Do you personally have a favorite celestial object? Well, I grew up, grew up in the sense of my PhD, uh, studying active galaxies or quasars or blazars and a sort of uh, minor species of active galaxy with supermassive black hole powering the activity. So I'm partial to active galaxies. And in a sense, my favorite quasar or active galaxy is, is the prototypical one, uh, 3C273. Um, it was the second quasar ever to be identified in 1963, I think, from the third ra radio catalog of the Cambridge Radio Observatory was identified at Palomar and eventually they found a high redshift and it was realized to be a very distant object. The very first quasar was 3C48 from the same catalog. 
So 3C273 is an incredibly luminous object. The black hole is probably a few billion times the mass of the sun's powering activity that makes that object about a hundred times brighter than an entire galaxy, all packed into a tiny region of a light day across. So that's my favorite object. It's a pretty powerful uh, active galaxy and a pretty big supermassive black hole. Excellent, thank you. Um, the next question is from Hernan, who sent an email um, about Uranus. So Uranus is unique in our solar system because it doesn't spin like a top, um, like all the other seven planets do, but more rolls on its side. Um, you've mentioned that this could have been or was due to a collision in the dif distant past, um, but how is it that the collision just seemingly tipped it on its side instead of expelling it from the solar system entirely? Um, so it's right that the, the 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 question of why Uranus's orbit is tilted by essentially 90 degrees, 87 degrees, is, is still an active research question. So the general issue with all of these things in the solar system is this type of archaeology is looking into the distant past at a time when we can't know what events happen. So we have a theory, for instance, of the moon forming from a collision on the Earth by a Mars type object, and that has some evidence to support it. We also have Venus, which is counter rotating, and that's also imputed to a collision early in the solar system. And Uranus, the same explanation has been proposed. So it seems a little convenient uh, because the direct evidence of that collision, of course, is long gone, and, but it's based on simulations. And so the collision hypothesis for why Uranus is tilted on its side is supported by simulations. There were simulations NASA did with other groups, NASA scientists and other researchers uh, about four years ago that did manage to reproduce uh, Uranus's uh, spin with a collision of a two times Earth mass object in the early solar system. There's a very low probability collision, but again, you can reproduce uh, Uranus's tilt that way. So that hypothesis is viable. It does have a problem, however, because that level of collision would create issues with the moon system of Uranus. And it's not clear that it, it, that may be a mark against this hypothesis. And because of that, a second hypothesis is in play and has been supported by other researchers, which is that Uranus had a much bigger ring system than it does now. All the giant planets have ring systems. Saturn is most prominent. And the Uranus and Neptune ring systems are pretty mild. But the idea is that they were much more prominent. And if you do dynamical simulations of Uranus with a big ring system and a lot of moons, you create an instability where there's a resonance between the orbital period of Uranus and its spin period. And that actually makes Uranus's spin unstable. So you can destabilize the spin of Uranus with a large ring system and in simulations. And, and then, of course, eventually the rings get disrupted and dissipate. It's also a very hard hypothesis to test, but it is a second idea that's out there. Well, the next question is from Rentgen101. Uh, when you apply relativity to a magnetic field, you can generate an electric field due to electrons in a conductor. Is there a similar effect um, to mass moving in a gravitational field? Well, um, Mass moving in a gravitational field, if that mass happens to be an electrically charged, uh, like an electron or a proton, um, moving in a gravitational field, I mean, there's no direct induction of a magnetic or electrical field from gravity itself. It's a completely different force of nature, and the coupling constant is also wildly different from the electromagnetic coupling. So the simple answer is no, there's no simple coupling of gravitational force into electric or magnetic effects. They're really quite distinct. Uh, the next question <clears throat> is um, from uh, one of our live participants. What originally piqued your interest in astronomy or the cosmos? Well, when I was growing up, I was interested in various things. I liked history, English. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I tried architecture for a while as a high school student. I interned with my, who was then my stepfather in Edinburgh. Um, but then I fell into the idea of physics because I liked physics in high school. So I studied it as an undergraduate. And, and physics 
is a pathway to astronomy because it will be one of the flavors of physics that you study as an undergraduate. We'll take an astronomy or an astrophysics course and then you get a taste of it. And so it was through exposure to physics. And in the way I like to think of it is astronomy or astrophysics is just the laws of physics projected out into the in wide, enormous universe. And it's extraordinary to many people, even people who do the work, that the entire universe can be governed and pretty well explained by just a very small number of laws of physics. Excellent. Um, so Sankirtana has sort of a related question. Um, they want to do their career in theoretical astronomy um, and they have a bachelor's degree. Sankirtana, can you tell us what your bachelor's is in in the chat? Um, but they'd like to know what education would suit them to head into a theoretical astronomical um, uh, program. Well, the people who in our university, in our department and elsewhere in the United States and, and other departments I know who do theoretical astrophysics as graduate students, they generally all had the same undergraduate training. They had a general astronomy or an astronomy physics degree, double major sometimes, or just a physics degree with no, no particular stress on astronomy. Um, basically, most graduate programs are self-contained and they contain theoretical astrophysics courses. And if you have an interest in that as a graduate student, you can use your electives because not all the courses in any program are required. You always get some free choice. You can use the free choice to take more theoretical courses. And so through a graduate program, you can prepare yourself for theoretical astrophysics. It's pretty hard to do as an undergraduate uh, because they just don't tend to teach enough and high enough level theoretical courses to give you that preparation. Excellent, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter? Um, is there any been is there any new news on LRO or is this is this a case of no news is good news because it's just humming along? Um, what's the current status? Yeah, LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, is a successful mission that is just doing its work, basically. I mean, it's mapping the moon. It's uh, giving us, you know, some nice detailed information. Because remember, the moon hasn't had a lot of attention from uh, space scientists or NASA in the last few decades. Mars has been getting all the attention, all the difficult missions, all the expensive missions. So to have a, a new moon orbiter that might be looking, uh, for example, for subsurface water, because that's of great interest to know where the water deposits on the moon are. They're typically under the moon's surface, but not far under, because eventually if we want a moon base, we're going to need to locate it at a place where there's available water locally. Now, you can generate water from hydrated minerals by electrochemical methods on the moon, but it's far easier if you actually find frozen water, water ice deposits under the surface. So that's a, a crucial thing that we're going to learn. And also there's an interest in lunar geology still from people who study the moon. They're, they're not, it's not like we understand everything about the moon. Uh, the next question is uh, from one of our live participants, Richie Spaceman asks, do we currently have the technology that could detect extraterrestrial life elsewhere in the universe? Well, just. We are on the verge of having that technology. If by detecting extraterrestrial life, we mean detecting uh, an exoplanet that has microbial activity that has changed the composition of the atmosphere, as happened on the Earth when microbes developed and generated oxygen as a byproduct of their metabolism. And that led to the Earth's atmosphere being 18% oxygen. An analogous process on another exoplanet is within the realm of detection in the next couple of years. Not right away, but it will need some very hard work with James Webb Space Telescope on just a handful of targets, or the next generation of 20 to 30 meter telescopes that are coming online at the end of the decade. So those are the that's a simple way in which life beyond Earth could first be detected. Of course, meanwhile, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is really the search for radio or optical technologies, uh, you know, deployed by a civilization, SETI continues and SETI has not succeeded in its first 60 years, but it could succeed at any time. And that experiment is ongoing. And that is another way we could detect life beyond Earth. 
Excellent. The next question is from uh, Jan Campos, uh, who sent an email. When looking at deep field images, um, it looks more like an even distribution of galaxies than a cosmic web. Why is it that uh, the pictures look like that? That's a good question. So when you look at a deep field image where you're essentially just looking at galaxies, remember it's in two dimensions. You're looking at a two dimensional representation of three dimensional space. And so the, all the galaxies project onto a plane. And these images tend to look crowded and the galaxies tend to look randomly distributed. And so part of the problem is you have to tease out that third dimension. And it's really only when you apply, uh, use spectroscopy to measure redshifts for those galaxies in the deep field images that you can then place them in a third dimension. And in the three dimensional view, these structures, the filaments, the voids, the clusters, the groups of galaxies start to stand out. The problem is that when you imagine a three-dimensional structure and you just compactify it, you just compress it into two dimensions, you just mush together all the structures in three dimensions onto two dimensions, and it's just crowded and confusing, and you can't see what those structures were. Uh, the next question is from Prab1307. Um, can you talk um, so the, the specific question is, can you talk about the characteristics of B stars and how they're different from other stars? What's their population in our Milky Way? But then perhaps you can talk about the different kinds of stars. Sure. Uh, the B star is just one of the stellar classification types. Um, the sequence is O, B, F, uh, and you have to remember with the acronym, uh, O, B, F, G, K, and so on. So these numbers originally, when stellar classification was done based on spectroscopy in the 1920s, it was an alphabetical sequence. That was the logical way to do it. But when people actually discovered what the masses and surface temperatures of these stars actually were, it turned out that the spectroscopy had been misleading people. The chemical abundance uh, was not linearly correlated with stellar photosphere temperature. And so the sequence got messed up and some letters even were missing. So end up with a very strange sequence of letters. So the B stars are obviously just down from the most massive and the hottest stars. O stars tend to have temperatures of 30 to 40,000 Kelvin. Um, and they tend to have masses maybe five to 10 times the mass of the sun. B stars are a little down from that, maybe 20,000 Kelvin and mass is three to five times the mass of the sun. So they're among the most massive main sequence stars. Their lifetimes are short because their masses are larger than the sun. So B stars typically live less than a billion years or around a billion years compared to the sun's 10 billion years. Excellent. Um, uh, the next question is from Ayup Arda, who asks, uh, to create DNA, enzymes are needed and enzymes are proteins. To create proteins, DNA is needed. In such an endless cycle, how did life begin with just a few chemical compounds? I mean, it's a good question because, um, you know, the complexity of modern biology makes it really hard to understand how that developed. How do you develop this interlocking, complex, self-sustaining chemical network, biochemical network? Well, it started as a pure chemical network. So before there was biology, there was simply chemistry. And what we do know is that in simulations and in the lab, we can generate from simple ingredients, simple molecular components, um, what is called an autocatalytic network, which is where the uh, object, where molecules can catalyze each other's and their own reactions. And sometimes that leads to more complexity. So you don't need any magic secret ingredient to generate complexity in a chemical soup in, with water. You just need to let the molecules interact with each other and they will grow in complexity. Now the trouble is no one's connected the dots from that uh, to a replicating molecule, even the very simplest forms of RNA. Uh, and no one's connected the dots from that to what we would call a, a metabolism, the basis of biology. So the simple answer to the question is we, we just don't know. It took on the earth maybe tens, maybe a hundred million years for, these, for this to evolve from pure chemical ingredients. And we've simulated some steps along that road and that path in the lab and theoretically, 
but we don't know how it actually happened. There are many possible pathways, and some of them may turn out to be rather serendipitous or accidental. Uh, the next question is from Pa Pasta Pastor. Uh, can you talk, um, you mentioned uh, 20 and 30 meter telescopes um, uh, when, earlier when you were talking about the James Webb. Uh, can you expand a little bit on these 20 and 30 meter telescopes and talk about what the future looks like for those and when they um, are coming online? Sure. The the three giant telescopes that are under that are under construction, they're all actually under construction or adva very advanced planning, are in going up in order of size. Uh, the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is the University of Arizona is a founding partner of a 10% share of, based on the fact that we make the mirrors, the seven 8.4 meter mirrors for that telescope. So that will be a, a net and effective aperture of 24 and a half meters composed of um, 8.4 meters arranged in a pedal sort of configuration, six around a central element. Uh, and that we're on the fifth mirror now, the last two are in, underway. And the site in Chile has been scraped off and buildings are being built. So that's underway, but the first light is still some years away. Uh, the second telescope is the 30 meter telescope, TMT, and that's a project of Caltech and the University of California, plus some international partners. And that's a project that has been mired in some level of controversy over being built on Mauna Kea, which is a site that native Hawaiians view as sacred and, and for which they're uh, unhappy about the level of construction on that site. Um, that very recently in the news that the management of the observatory there has been taken from the University of Hawaii, which had it for decades, and been given to the state, to the governor essentially. Uh, so the governor and the government of Hawaii is now operating Mauna Kea, and that may provide a way through the impasse. Uh, so that construction may start up again, but in the moment it's on a hold. And probably the most advanced of the three large telescopes is the, the, the biggest of the three, the European telescope, which is 39 meters and is made of a, over a thousand hexagonal elements that will be a computer controlled to operate as one dish. That's also destined for Chile at a site that the European Southern Observatory owns and operates in northern Chile. Um, and it is fully funded, as far as I can tell, from the international treaties that govern the European Southern Observatory. Their funding stream is the most reliable of the three and the biggest because it comes from all the European countries. Uh, and that is also under construction as we speak and might be the first of the three to get to first light. Um, as a follow up to the earlier question about DNA um, and enzymes, um, what do you think about RNA world theory? So I believe this is the theory that RNA was would have been the precursor molecule to something more complex right. to DNA. So there is a, an idea called RNA world, which is a, is a hypothesis about how we got to modern biology. So, and it's, it's the idea is that it's a transitional stage uh, to the modern cell. In the modern cell, uh, the DNA in the nucleus is the sort of, the, that's the fortress of information. DNA is a very robust and sturdy molecule that replicates with very high uh, fidelity. Uh, and that's the information carrier of life. Uh, RNA is a, is a transfer molecule. It transfers information. It's more adaptable. It's less sturdy as a molecule, um, but it's quite likely that RNA evolved before DNA. And so you can have what's called RNA world. You can just have a replicating molecule that is just RNA and not DNA yet, uh, where information is stored and transmitted. Uh, and, it, and it varies over time. There's adaptation, there's mutation, there's error rate of transcription because it's not perfect. Um, and so that's viewed as a transitional stage. There's an alternative hypothesis to RNA world, which is called metabolism first, which essentially decides that you don't actually need a fully replicating large and long molecule like RNA, but you can actually set up an autocatalytic network, which the sum of the components amounts to a, met a metabolic system, which would approximate a metabolic system with, of the modern cell, but you haven't got a cell yet. So that's also a hypothesis for how life started. Uh, the next question is from an email from uh, David McKenzie. How does the Parker Solar Probe withstand the constant high temperatures that it's subject subjected to so close to the sun? 
That's a good question. So the Parker Solar Probe is is generating fantastic data and and up close images of the sun, uh, and it is in a very intense radiation environment. Well, the methods that NASA uses to operate satellites in extreme environments are, you know, fairly simple. They use highly reflective materials. Uh, they use structural elements that are designed to dissipate heat so the heat can't concentrate in, in large masses in the satellite, you know, where it might just cause overheating of electrical components and so on. Um, and, and those methods actually work pretty well. And it also has very robust construction. So the Parker probe was built not in the way that an average satellite was built. It was built to withstand these amazing temperatures. Uh, there, for example, has been a Venus, a couple of Venus missions that have been green lighted by NASA for towards the end of the decade, and they're going to have to survive the Venusian atmosphere. Um, and and so NASA does know how to make spacecraft that are extremely sturdy against heat and radiation. Uh, the next question um, is sort of is related to this, um, and it's. Um, why is it so difficult to get to the sun? Um, I hear that uh, part of the Parker space probe was the fastest space probe ever to launch. Uh, why was that necessary to get to the sun, which you know it seems like you could just point at it and go to the sun? Yes, so that's a good question. So you, the gravity is going in that direction. So it seems like it would be easier to get to the sun than to get to the outer solar system. And indeed, to get to the outer solar system, you have to use tricks like gravitational slingshot to help you get there with limited fuel. So you do need tricks to get to the outer solar system. So what's the problem with the inner solar system? The problem with the inner solar system is not that gravity isn't helping you get there or helping you accelerate towards your destination. The problem is what happens when you get there. So you can have too much speed to set yourself up in an easy, stable orbit that's close enough to the object you want to study. And so that's the real problem, that once the Parker probe gets towards the sun, it has so much speed that, that figuring out how to generate a plausible orbit that doesn't isn't too highly elliptical becomes quite a challenge, and it's an orbital mechanics issue. Um, so you have to set up looping orbits that gradually regularize and give you the orbit you want. And if you have too much speed, that makes that whole process very slow and inefficient. Uh, David Learning asks, what is the significance of space plasma waves in astronomy? Well, um, space has a lot of plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter after solid liquid and gas. It represents a very high temperature gas where the electrons have all been stripped from the nuclei. Uh, and it's usually a very diffuse uh, system as well. Plasma, astrophysical plasmas tend to be very low density and they're often very high temperature. They have to, they are high temperature by definition because the electrons have been stripped from the atoms. Um, so there are many situations where there are uh, astrophysical plasmas. And in those plasmas, since it is a gas, if a very high temperature one, you can obviously have waves propagating. So plasma waves are a routine phenomena. So if you have, for example, a, a compact object like a neutron star or a black hole uh, that exists in a high radiation environment, it will be surrounded by a plasma and variations or spin of the object can generate waves through that plasma. So it's quite easy to generate plasma waves. Uh, the next question is from uh, Twitch Quest One, who is Aditya, who asks, how would we measure altitude if there were hypothetically no water on Earth? Um, would we use the stars or the sun or the moon to somehow measure altitude? How would that be done? Um, it's an interesting question because it, it, it illuminates the fact that measuring altitude on the Earth is actually quite difficult. Um, so we do tend to measure altitude relative to sea level. Um, but the sea, of course, the oceans of the world migrate around the planet and they take different levels. I mean, I'm sure people know that when the Panama Canal was carved through the Isthmus of Panama about 100 years ago, the level of water on the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans was about 29, I think, some, some number like that, feet different. Uh, and, and those the locks in the Panama Canal actually have to navigate that altitude difference. 
So what does sea level mean if the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans are at different levels? And so that's just a general phenomena. And it's all to do with the fact that the Earth, of course, is not a perfect sphere, uh, that the, um, you know, the oceans migrate and move around, they respond to gravity, they respond to the moon, of course, tides. And so defining altitude on the Earth is actually very non-trivial, and it's not just a matter of the oceans, it's also on the land. Redefinition of altitude, I remember recently, and many people probably saw this too, caused us to redefine the height of Mount Everest, the highest point on the continents, because the measurement got more accurate. And so we're remeasuring altitude all the time. Um, and that's a great segue to our next question. Um, as climate change causes more ice cap melting, um, will Earth's altitudes have to be adjusted based on new sea level? I mean, what are the things that can cause these uh, measurements to change? Yeah, exactly. So uh, climate change that causes a polar ice cap melting will raise world sea levels. And that, of course, means the reference point for altitude, if you use sea level, will change. Um, so the other way, of course, to imagine measuring altitude is you could define, you could decide, given the density profile of the Earth, and it's not a spherically symmetric object, as we know, uh, we could imagine where the dead center of the Earth is, the gravitometric center, if you like, the full mass center based on local gravity. And you could just measure altitude at a surface based on the distance from that point. We don't know how to measure that quite accurately enough. And also remember the Earth is a moving target. We have plate tectonics, we have magma flows within the mantle. These are huge motions of dense rock and include some metals. And so the density profile of the planet actually changes because it's geologically active. And so altitude, even measured by some gravitometric center relative to some center that way, will actually change over time. Um, Alexandra Panda Bear asks, uh, what courses would you suggest taking uh, when someone is interested in beginning to study deep space? Well, for deep space, that's a phrase that could encompass a number of things. It could be astronomy. It could be the deep space of uh, deep space networks, for example, people who actually figure out communication in deep space. It could mean the deep space in the solar system and our exploration of our immediate environment. So deep space is a kind of a broad term, and you could take courses on, on all aspects of that. I mean, for an astronomer, deep the deepest of deep space is, of course, the universe itself, and that would be cosmology. So you would take a cosmology course. Uh, but you could also take a planetary science course that had significant uh, time given to the outer solar system. It's a part of the solar system we don't understand that well. The Kuiper Belt, for example, is deep space beyond the orbit of the eight planets. Uh, it range from about 40 to 100 astronomical units, and we really don't know the composition and the demographics of the objects in the Kuiper Belt very well at all. You could take a course, probably not undergraduate, but a graduate level course on the Kuiper Belt. So depending on your part of the deep space you're interested in, yes, there are a number of courses you can take. Uh, the next question is from Valia D. This is their, their first question, so thank you for joining us. Um, I understand that supermoons somehow occur when the orbit of the moon is closer to Earth, but I do not understand how it is related to Earth's orbit around the sun and the seasons like summer or winter. Yeah, so the Earth, sun, moon system, those three objects, is fairly complex. And so these, the, these orbits relate to each other. The orbit of the moon around the Earth is not independent of the orbit of the Earth around the sun, because obviously there's a center of gravity of the Earth-Moon system uh, that is what is moving around the sun. Um, because of the tilt of the Earth, the changing tilt of the Earth, and the inclination of the moon's orbit around the Earth compared to the Earth's orbit around the sun, there are these complex interplays between these different orbital elements. So you actually have to model it fairly careful, carefully. And then, so basically you can't talk about a supermoon or any particular lunation of the moon without considering where the Earth is in its orbit. And of course it has a varying distance from the sun. 
Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, let me just uh, grab one of these next questions. Um, Alexander Panda Bear would like to know if you have any book recommendations for people who are interested in reading more about various topics in astronomy. Um, well, that's, you open the door and I'll mention a couple of my own books. Why not? Um, my last book was Einstein's Monsters, The Life and Times of Black Holes. So if you're interested in black holes, I would recommend that. And the one before that was called Beyond Our Future in Space. And that's about the burgeoning commercial and private space industry and our ability to leave the earth and live on other planets and colonize other planets. Um, but more generally in astronomy, there, there are books written all the time. I mean, literally I'm not up on it anymore because uh, they're in terms of trade books on astronomy. So non-technical books written by the main publishers that are not textbook publishers. Um, there are probably 30 or 40 good books on astronomy. Um, I'll just mention, you know, maybe a couple that I know about that I that are I think have a particularly good flavor to them. There's a uh, one called Black Hole Blues by Jan Eleven. Uh, she's a, a very good young researcher on black holes and relativity. And Black Hole Blues is just a very nice evocation of gravitational waves and how they were first detected using interviews with the main people involved. So that that's definitely one I would recommend. Um. So Annie Ice um, apparently is plugged in because uh, she says she's from Kosovo and uh, sees that you are going to be a speaker at the first astronomy convention um, that's uh, being held there. Um, how knowledgeable uh, are you about the country and uh, can you talk about whether are you excited to talk there and uh, uh, what that what's that going to be about? Yeah, then this is a bittersweet story. Um, I got invited by Pran Hiseni, who's the you know very bright young astronomer who's a grad student at the University of California at Santa Cruz, and and she's uh, from Kosovo, grew up there, and is really an entrepreneur of astronomy in her own country. She formed an amateur astronomer network. She started an observatory, and she got funding out of her Ministry of Education uh, for what would be what is the first international conference in astronomy in Kosovo. And I'm one of a handful of keynote speakers. The sting in the tail is I had, I got COVID last week, and so I can't make the trip. I would be there right now, actually. Um, I'm going to give my talks remote, unfortunately. I mean, unfortunately, because I'd much rather be there. Uh, but it is a very big deal to have this meeting in Kosovo and, and the first one. And I, so I hope there's a second one where I can actually go because I've never been to Kosovo. Um, the next question is from TwitchQuest1, um, who asks, uh, if I take a laser and move it across the sky, say across the moon, the laser light moves the diameter pretty quickly. Now say I move the laser across the galaxy. Um, so how could it be that the laser light could be traversing these distances faster than the sped said speed of light at those, uh, at those distances? Right, it's a good question. So you can obviously pivot a laser beam and depending on how far away that laser beam reaches the, the object it's moving across, you could in principle be moving that beam across a surface, say if it was a planet or the galaxy, which is just a lot of stars, faster than light speed. So is that violating relativity? And the answer is no, because relativity is about how information is transmitted from A to B. And it really just says the speed of light is a limit for that transmission, sending a wave carrying information from A to B. But if you think about what's happening when you pivot a beam across an object like the moon or whatever, um, you're not actually taking information from A to B. So there's no information that travels from one place on the moon's surface to the other. You're just illuminating a track across the moon at a rate faster than light speed. So technically and formally, according to the theory of relativity, you're not violating relativity at all. You're not violating information transmission uh, limitations. Um, so Alexander Panda Bear, I'm going to try and translate these questions. Um, if I if I get them incorrect, you can correct me and I can um, ask uh, Chris again. Um, but uh, they ask, let's see. Um, in being a professor and having an extensive background in astronomy and physics, do 
you ever feel as knowledgeable as you are? Or does having that knowledge make you feel more knowledgeable? Or does it make you feel more humble? Um, because you know what there is to know and how how uh, the world works? Well, that's a good question. I mean, this it's a personal question, of course. Different people may feel different ways. Some people from their depth of knowledge feel very powerful and empowered. I mean, and I like to feel a bit of that too. But I think astronomy is a humbling subject because unlike other subjects you could study, we've not really predicted most of the things we found in the universe. It's surprised us at every turn. It's a discovery field of science, which is not true of all fields. Um, and so astronomy and the history of astronomy does tend to make you a little humble because you'll be foolish and hubris to imagine we know everything about the universe or we figured out things. We figured out some things. We have a theory of the universe called the Big Bang and it works pretty well. We have a pretty good theory of how stars evolved that we've had that first century. We think we know some things about how planets form, but not really very much because we get surprised by exoplanets. So I think the astronomy is is a, a sobering subject for people who like to think we know everything or we're on the way to complete knowledge because it reminds us very often uh, that we don't know everything. Um, now, Isaac Newton had a great quote for this. Um, he, he was referring, and he was the master of gravity, of course, in his day, his theory still is a supreme theory of gravity. He said, if I have, uh, he said, I feel like I have been on a beach turning over one or more pretty pebbles while the vast sea of knowledge lay undiscovered before me. So I've probably mangled that quote, but that's the gist of it. So he felt even in his mastery of the theory of gravity and everything he did in optics and telescope design and so on and mechanics, uh, that he was just sh looking at shiny pebbles on a beach where there were many pebbles to examine and a sea of knowledge of like ignorance ahead of him. So that's a good reference point. If, if Newton could feel that, then I think most scientists should be uh, feeling that too. Well, not to do too much of a shameless plug here, but one of your books is called Humble Before the Void. And right. uh, is, that, is that a reference to you? Is that a reference to the people that you interacted with? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. Title. So I, do have a book called Humble Before the Void, um, and it was written for Templeton Press. I think it came out maybe eight or nine years ago now. It's in paperback. Um, and it was about the times I've spent, this was the first time, but I've been many times since, going to India, uh, various parts of India, to teach Tibetan monks and nuns cosmology. And the title refers to their perspective, the Eastern uh, monastic perspective on knowledge and 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 they are humble indeed about knowledge so the people I was teaching they're extremely accomplished in their field there are some of them are geshes which is very high level of qualification in their monastic tradition so they have had 20 years of training even after school uh, after leaving school in rhetoric and philosophy and comparative religion and so on they know an enormous amount but they don't think they know everything and they are they have a humility towards nature and towards the things they don't know that's very profound. It's part of their tradition. It's not so much a personal thing as it was It was omnipresent. I felt it with almost everyone I interacted with. So I put that in the title of the book just to convey that out of these Eastern traditions, there's sometimes a very different perspective. Now, the, this is characterizing it and maybe stereotyping it a little bit much, but the stereotype of East versus West is that the Western mindset or, or a science mindset in particular is that we can control nature, we can take things apart, we can understand them, put them back together, make them better. I mean, it's sort of a controlling, manipulative uh, mindset. The Eastern mindset, again, caricaturing it a little bit, is a more contemplative mindset. It's more about uh, inner peace. It's more about compassion. It's more about how you live in harmony with the world and not so much about whether you pick things apart and put them together or make them better or control things through technology. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, the next question is from Valia D. Is the speed of light supposed to be constant around the universe? Um, and then there's a follow-up question that's related, but we'll get to that. Yes. In in modern physics and in relativity theory, the speed of light is a universal constant. 
So that's the premise of relativity, and relativity has been confirmed, uh, you know, amply and abundantly in labs all around the world and for a century. However, the testing of that premise of general relativity, that the speed of light is a universal constant, that the speed of light uh, billions of light years away in a distant galaxy is functioning the same as the speed of light in our galaxy, that is not tested yet. And it's actually not directly testable at all. So the truth is we only have very indirect measurements or tests or constraints on whether the speed of light is constant through the universe. Uh, people have proposed, for example, what are called tired light theories, where the speed of light actually varies. And so when light reaches us from a very distant place, it might take longer than we would calculate using what we think is the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, and it is actually quite difficult to disprove those ideas. There's evidence against them, but it's, it's pretty hard to disprove. So that's a little um, to be determined, essentially, to measure the speed of light elsewhere in the universe and show that it's the same. So the follow-up question, <clears throat> um, or originally um, this was connected to the speed of light being constant, but you know that's it was kind of an implied connection that may not be there. But the next question is, um, you know, is there how do we know or do we know that there's no dark matter that absorbs light and slows it down, for example? Um, so things that might impede or interfere with light traveling through the universe. Um, Dark matter, we think, very clearly does not do that. And the reason is that because even though we don't know what dark matter is, what we do know about dark matter, part of the reason that it's dark, is that whatever particle, fundamental particle, we think constitutes dark matter, it has extremely weak or absent electromagnetic interactions. So it's coupling to the electromagnetic field in any situation is weak or absent, which means it doesn't absorb, reflect, scatter, or interfere with light at all. So, but dark matter really doesn't see light and light doesn't see dark matter. So that's the simplest answer to the question. The only things we know that can impede and interfere with light are small real particles, not dark matter particles, but just particles like soot or tiny pebbles in space or microscopic dust grains. Those dust grains, because of their sizes of a few microns, uh, do actually interfere with and uh, they absorb light and then re-radiate it at longer wavelengths and so essentially they quench optical light and so dust is the biggest uh, interference with light in the universe that we know of. Uh, there's a conversation going on in the chat um, and Pop uh, Pastor Pastor uh, uh, doesn't uh, is not familiar with Messier objects. So um, I think uh, it would be great if you could talk a little about what Messier objects are. Um, and then um, it's related to the conversation about astrophotography. Um, so you can maybe talk about the history of astronomy and Sure. And the Messier catalog or the Messier objects are a very iconic set of objects in astronomy. They're extremely important for amateur astronomers who spend a lot of time and effort uh, observing them and bagging them if you like it's very competitive and but also to professional astronomers because the messier catalog includes some very striking and important objects charles messier was a an astronomer in the late 18th century and i think his catalog dates from about 1790 uh, and he was a comet hunter so he was using the telescopes of his time to look for moving objects in the sky uh, comets are fuzzy, but of course, as they move across the sky, they, they change position relative to the stars night to night. And Messier essentially made a catalog of fuzzy objects that did not move from night to night. And so there were objects that were not comets uh, and objects to avoid if you're a comet hunter. So his catalog is a sort of not comet catalog, which is kind of interesting. And what that means, of course, is it turns out to be a catch-all of all, all sorts of things. They're united only in the fact that they're nebulous or fuzzy. And so the Messier catalog, they're given M numbers, um, includes a mixture, about one third of the 110 objects in the catalog are galaxies. About one third are nebulae or star forming regions, you know, diffuse regions where stars are forming or have formed. Uh, and then another third are kind of uh, late stages of stellar evolution, like supernova remnants, planetary nebulae, and so on. So it's a it's a mixture. 
Um, they're very interesting objects. They're very bright, of course, because his telescope wasn't that large, and that's what lets amateurs look at them, and the professionals get very detailed information on them, too. Uh, so some of the famous objects in the that are galaxies in the catalog, of course, are uh, M31, Andromeda Nebula, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, M101, another neighbor of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, the Crab Pulsar is in there. I forget its M number. I think M49. Um, and so, you know, there are people who've memorized all these. I don't know all 110, uh, but it's a very important catalog. Um, excellent. Uh, the next question is um, um, from one of our live participants who says, uh, I saw something on the internet that says the color magenta does not actually exist, that it's a weird thing that the human brain made up. Is that true? Can you talk a little bit about color in pictures and human perception versus in astronomy? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, magenta is a hue. It's a, it's a sort of a form of a color. It's a shade of a color rather than a primary color like red, which would be its nearest relative. So the colors, the primary colors do exist. They are physiological and actual because there are wavelengths we can associate to them. And we can combine them in ways that make sense. So color uh, harmony in painting and art is a rather different from physical colors. So physical colors are based on the wavelength of light. So I think magenta is just a hue as opposed to a primary color, and that may be the reason it's in a particular limbo category. But astronomers don't actually talk about colors so much as wavelengths because color comes down to perception. And not every person sees color the same way. There are people who can distinguish that whose people whose eyes not only give them maybe slightly larger range of wavelength than other people's eyes, so they can see further into red and a little further into blue. That that happens. But there are definitely people whose acuity to shades and variations in color, uh, which is the mean wavelength basically, is better than others. There are people apparently who can distinguish hundreds of thousands or even millions of shades or hues of colors, and then others who can not do a hundred times less than that. So the physiology of color is probably more dominant than the physics of color. Um, and it is almost time for us to wrap <laughs> up. Um, TwitchQuest1 um, asks specifically about the color indigo um, in a Roy G. Biv, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, and I uh, would like to know if it's true that it was only added due to sort of the mystical fascination of Isaac Newton. And that's a good question. So I don't know the Newton part of the answer. I mean, the Roy Gabiv, the, the sort of seven colors of the rainbow, is was based on a physical thing where if you take a prism and you spread the light of the rainbow or spread the colors of white light into their component parts and you roughly even divide, evenly divide them in wavelength, you do indeed end up with these seven divisions. So the blue indigo violet, the short wavelength part of this uh, mapping, may, puts essentially equal wavelength intervals on the blue side as you have on the red side with red, orange, yellow. So there's a sense, there's a reason, there's a, it makes sense in that sense of dividing it. Um, as for Isaac Newton, uh, I'm gonna have to look at that one. I don't know the answer to that. Um, Thanks for the questions. Varied and interesting as always. Um, I don't remember. We do have another one scheduled, maybe in a week and a bit, but um, we'll definitely be back with you. So thanks to Vicky and Matthew for facilitating. Yes, that's correct. We have a live session in about two weeks, not quite two full weeks, because it'll be Monday uh, the 22nd. Um, so, you know, like 11 more days. Um, so we will see everyone then. That will be on YouTube on our uh, channel there. Um, we can post a link to that channel in the chat. Uh, we'll do that during the post stream. So thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate the questions. We love having you and we love spending this time with you um, thinking about and talking about astronomy. So uh, we will see you again in uh, just a week and a half. Keep looking up. <laughs>